a while ago, I built a 16-bit computer from the ground up only using very simple ICs. Before we get to running any programs, let me give you a quick overview on how this thing works. If you want to skip the explanation, you can go to 750. The unifying part of the computer, or any processor really, is the main bus, which is really nothing more than a set of 16 wires, which makes the computer a 16-bit computer. That bus can be used to transfer 16-bit values between different parts of the computer. Hooked up to that bus are different components. The simplest are registers. All a register does is store a 16-bit value, so a value from 0 to 65,535. We have four general purpose registers, A through D. They each independently store a value, and they can also load a value from the bus or put their value on the bus, which could then be loaded by another component. If, for example, we wanted to copy the contents of A to B, we would put A's value on the bus and then tell B to store the value that's currently on the bus. And just like that, we can transfer values between all registers. Registers A and B are special in that they additionally can be used to do math. They are connected to the ALU, which is the part of the computer responsible for mathematical operations, the arithmetic logic unit. The ALU can perform different calculations, for example, adding A and B, and then output the result to the bus. Let's calculate the sum of A and B and store it in C. We first tell the ALU that we want to add and to put its result on the bus, just like a normal register would. Just like before, we can load the value from the bus into a register, in this case C. Now the sum of A and B is stored in C. That's great, but we don't really have a way to store data yet. To do that, we need RAM. RAM is really just a table of numbers. You put a row number in, and it returns whatever is in that row. You can either read it or overwrite it. To store that row number, the memory address, we need another register, the appropriately named MAR or memory address register. It behaves just like the other registers, except its value is also hooked up to RAM. To read memory at a certain address, we first load that address into the MAR. In this case, we load 2 into the MAR because we're interested in row number 2. Then RAM can output that value to the bus, and it can be, for example, stored in a register. We can, of course, also write to RAM like this. Those are the core components of a processor, and you can imagine we can sort of do calculations manually by telling components what to do, but of course, the aim is for the computer to do that automatically. For that, we're going to need a few more components. The first and simplest is a clock. The clock simply switches from a 0 to a 1 and back at a given rate, and that's what's being specified when someone talks about a processor having so and so many megahertz or gigahertz. Rather than telling components what to do manually, we want to execute code. You might be familiar with code in C or some other programming language, but in one way or another, all of these languages get converted to a language called assembler, which looks like this and is about the most low-level programming language there is. At this low level, CPUs use extremely basic languages because they are easier to handle. Each of these lines or instructions like MOV A to C can be encoded just as a single number, which means the program is really just a list of numbers each one telling the CPU to do one specific thing. Guess what can store a list of numbers? RAM. So we write our program, which again is really just a list of numbers, to RAM. Now the program is stored in the processor. To execute it, we need, who guessed it, more registers. The IP, or instruction pointer, stores which line we're currently executing, or in more technical terms, the memory address of the current instruction. So it will start at zero, and then count up every time an instruction has been executed. The IR, or instruction register, stores which instruction we're currently executing by storing the instruction's number, for example, 3 in the case of MOV A to C. Now, to actually execute an instruction, the computer just follows fairly simple steps. It first moves the line or address of the instruction that we want to execute into the memory address register. We start at line 0, so the instruction pointer is set to 0, and that is loaded into the memory address register. Then it moves the instruction at that address from RAM to the instruction register. Finally, we also increment the instruction pointer to prepare the execution of the next instruction, which will be at the next address. As you can see, there are far more steps available than what we actually need to load an instruction. These six further steps changed based on what instruction we have actually loaded. This is managed by the control logic, which tells every other part of the computer what to do based on what instruction is in the IR. 
for the move A to C instruction we just loaded, for example, the first step would be to move A to C, which is exactly what the control logic does. At this point, the first instruction has been executed, so we start at step one again. Since we incremented the instruction pointer earlier, we now load the following instruction into the instruction register. Once again, the control logic decodes the instruction and in this case adds B to A. And just like this, all following instructions can be executed. There's one thing we're still missing though. There's no straightforward way of writing a classic if statement yet. For that, we need instructions like this one, jump not zero, which do something only if a certain condition has been met. These conditions are stored in the flags register. Every time the ALU calculates something, it also updates the flags register, which stores certain facts about the result of the last calculation. If the result was zero, for example, ZF, the zero flag is set. If it was odd, PF, the parity flag is set. SF, the sign flag, is set if the result was negative. And finally, CF, the carry flag, is set if the result was too big to store in a 16-bit number. Now, the control logic can look at these flags and only do something if certain conditions are met. In this case, only jump to line zero if the last result was not zero. Like that, we can, for example, execute something a certain number of times by subtracting one every time and checking if the result is zero. If it's not zero, it's executed once again. Otherwise, execution is stopped. In this example, we want to execute something twice. So we store a two in A. Subtracting one from that, of course, yields one, which is odd, so the parity flag is set but importantly, not zero, so the zero flag isn't set and execution continues. Now in the next iteration, the result is zero, so the zero flag is set and execution stops. In code, this would look something like this. As you can see, we make use of a label, loop, to jump back if the result wasn't zero. Otherwise, we continue to the halt instruction, which stops execution by halting the clock. And that's it, a computer. This example is of course quite simplified, but should cover the basics of how a computer works. For a more complete and thorough explanation, check out Ben Eta's series on building an 8-bit computer, which is linked in the description. Now, let's take a look at the actual thing. You can see many of the things we talked about earlier, like the different registers. Each register has 16 LEDs, so we can read its value, and there's also an additional register, the output register, which works just like the other ones, but is also hooked up to the output display, so we can see its value in a little more readable format. Up here you can see the ALU with registers A and B hooked up to it. The sum register is the output of the ALU and you can also see the flags register. Down here you can see the control logic. The micro instruction counter counts what step we're in in the execution of the current instruction and the control word basically shows what the computer is doing right now. For example, if ARO, the third LED from the right is lit, the A register is currently outputting to the bus. Below that, you can see the clock, just based on 505 timers. These LEDs here show what's currently on the bus, and this is the input section, where you can program the computer. You can also see one register we haven't talked about earlier, the stack pointer, which can be used for such things as function calls and recursion. Let's start simple. I'll write a program that simply counts up the A register. In the main function, we'll increment the A register and then jump back to the beginning to create an infinite loop. This is the human readable code in assembly. To convert it to the list of numbers we need, we run it through the assembler I wrote for this processor. It spits out a list of three numbers. The first number is the increment A instruction, the next one is a jump instruction, and the third number encodes where we want to jump to. In this case, back to the beginning, so zero. The list we can now use to program the computer. Let's first make sure the mar is set to zero because we want to write the first instruction. Next, we can input the first instruction and write it to RAM. Okay. With RAM out, we can check if everything worked. And perfect, the first instruction is stored in RAM. Next, we set the mar to one to write the second instruction.
Once again, we save it to RAM and check if everything worked. Nice. We do this one final time, set the MAR to 2, but this time we have it easy because we only need to write a 0 to RAM. Now the program is written to the computer, hopefully without any mistakes. Let's turn on the clock, moment of truth. Perfect, it works. You can see the a red star counting up. The parity flag is blinking as we count through even and odd numbers. The instruction register is quickly switching between the increment and the jump instructions we wrote. This is the lowest clock suite of about 90 Hz, though we can easily turn up the clock a bit to count faster. The maximum we can do is about 17 kHz, which is this fast. When doing simple things like counting, we can even go higher to around 50 kHz, but complex programs don't run anymore at such clock speeds because the flags aren't set properly anymore. As you can tell, this whole manual programming process does get very tedious, especially for larger programs. That's why I built this programming header, which does exactly what I just did manually, just automatically and a lot faster. To test it, let's upload this program which also counts but on the output register, so we can read the value on the display. I'll assemble it once again using the assembler, but this time I'll use the bin file it generates. I can upload that to the programmer and just press the button. You can see the bus and mar flash up for a split second and the program is written. For just counting, we don't need a computer though. Let's look at a program that actually does something useful. This program calculates the Fibonacci numbers, stopping when they get larger than 16 bits. Let's upload it and run. Okay, the final result is B520, which is 46,368 in decimal and also the 24 Fibonacci number. By turning up the clock, we can do it even faster. And this is what happens when you turn up the clock too much. More videos will follow where we run some more complex programs on this machine, but this is it for now. Thanks for watching, and don't worry, new rocket engine content will follow too. I'm currently working on a liquid rocket engine.